this, and I, I also teach um, a class here at the college. So that's my interaction. <laughs> So today we're going to be looking at things you can do other than a worksheet in your class. Uh, um, so it says in this session, the presenter will share hands on activities to improve student engagement. These activities are versatile, versatile and need little preparation, but can take place of the place of the place. Look, it can take the place of the place Whoops, of a worksheet. OK, so just in the chat or speaking, if you'd like to talk, what, what was your favorite memory of being in school? So for example, for me, if I think of my favorite thing ever in school, I think of my kindergarten teacher giving me a big ball of clay. You know, we had just regular clay to play with. Does anybody have a favorite memory of things you did in school? Yeah. Chat. Somebody put something in doing activity. Um, yeah, we had a teacher who had gone to Africa um, when I was in the fourth oh. grade, and we all got to build uh, an animal, and then we made a movie out of it. So it was very hands-on and oh, wow. a lot of fun. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Africa. I remember one summer when I was in summer school, and we put on plays. Oh, and I loved that. That would have been really fun. Anyone else? We had some in the chat. We had, um, wait a minute, I'll get my mouse going here. Someone said, taking my students to various countries eating. Um, my friend's mom came into my second grade class to teach painting, building bridges out of uh, tongue depressors. Uh, physics teacher did live demos. I guess my point here is sort of like, no one said a worksheet. So. <laughs> Probably your best um, memories of school don't include sitting and doing worksheets. And like, I think we need to keep that in mind when we're working with our students that, you know, worksheets are really great um, and they give us a lot of practice and give us, let us know, you know, what students know. But as for memory, being a memorable educational experience and retaining what they learn, mm, we need to probably should like maybe vary it up. Would you agree? Okay, I'll go on. So the first little strategy we have here is just a game called Kaboom. Um, for Kaboom, you just get uh, tongue depressor sticks or popsicle sticks and, um, and you just, oops, sorry, that's me trying to turn off this. Okay. So you get popsicle sticks and you can first, you want to identify what you want to work on. These are great for review or just to figure, you know, a game to break things up. So you identify a skill you want to work on and you just go get, these are a dollar at the dollar store, pretty big pack. And then you can put your skills on the popsicle sticks or the tongue depressors. And we, I have, if you can see my screen, I have a I have a, a kaboom container we keep them in and we have kaboom sticks and we out at my agency, we color code them so that, you know, the blue sticks are addition and then just addition facts. And maybe you have one with uh, uh, adjectives, uh, vocabulary words. You can do a lot of different things on the kaboom sticks, but you pick your skill and then you kind of put them on the stick and then you make a several sticks that just say kaboom, like in the picture on the slide. So what happens is you put them in the, in the cup or whatever you have them in. And we have people go into the prison and they just make them on paper strips and pull them from an envelope. So you can adapt it that way. Um, but if they're right, they get to keep the stick. If they're wrong, the stick goes back in the cup. But if they pull a kaboom stick, they've put all the sticks they earned back into the cup. So that way things get pulled again and practiced more. And for some reason, it seems like such a simple game, but students really enjoy it. And it's a great way to reinforce a skill without a worksheet. It's, it's just a simple, um, it's just a, a very simple skill to have on hand. Um, can anybody, does anybody think of an idea of a skill they would put on something like this? I was thinking of verbs, very, yeah. various different kinds of, you know, do present tense have people put them in sentences. Um, do you know if anything like this has been done online? 
I don't. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there was an online one. And, you know, I should probably look that up because I too like online, but um, we kind of use a different, I, we use sort of a similar thing, just making it on um, flip a card thing. Uh, Quizlet, you know, Quizlet, you can make flashcards and they flip. We kind of make a similar thing that says kaboom on there, but I don't, there might be an app that has a kaboom function on there because there seems to be so many things, but I've used them for like, just, we use them a lot for vocabulary, for citizenship, um, science facts, just anything that needs some practice and stuff. And it is funny because the game never ends. If you think about it, someone's always gonna pull the kaboom stick, right? And so it doesn't end. You just get to a point where you're kind of, you know, they're done with it. But um, it's just been an easy way to reinforce a lot of things and see to learn what your students know and to listen to them. And it works with a group or just like one-on-one, -on -one, you and the student. So anyone else have an idea what you would put on them? Uh, Beth said in the chat, uh, vocab and money. Money. Oh, yeah. I, I, I have seen them with actually plastic money tape glued to them onto the sticks with like fake kids money from the dollar store or something. Um, you could do and you'll I have another idea for this, but you could do percentages, you know, like you have an amount and they pull and they figure out the percentage. So you could use them for math. You can use them for reading. We have something else in the chat, Rachel. Um, well, Beth also said vocab. Oh, okay. Yeah. And Lynn, I know you're out there and I know you've used them. I unmuted. I was waiting for people to stop talking. I am um, question starters. Oh, like nice. ESL or, you know, like to get people talking. Yeah. And what And also what if, what would you rather? Would you rather do, you know, be an elephant or a donkey? I don't know. Yeah. Um, at the ESL class, when I visited, one of the teachers were using them for, um, they had to, was it beginning ESL? And they had to pull a stick and kind of make an expression to go with the mood or the feeling on the stick. Um, it was really funny. They had, they had a lot of fun with it, you know, grumpy and they had to act grumpy or, and if they didn't, you know, if they didn't express it well, they had to put, you know, put it back in the cup. It was a fun way to sort of explore. And then they get kaboom and they all laugh and they put it back, you know, so it's fun that way too. But we've used it in so many different ways. We have different sets of sticks. It's just an easy breakup game. Someone else said something in the chat, I think. Yeah, Christine said math facts, um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division. Yes, thank you. So that's just an easy, I mean, cheap dollar sticks from the Dollar General. You know, it's easy to easy to move around and keep on hand as, as a, just a nice kickoff to your lesson. Like if you get together to tutor, it's just an easy thing to pull out and practice and break the ice with and be active and have them talking. So that's one idea. Now, this is a technique or a strategy called- Hey, shoot. Meg. Yes. There was a question in the chat that I think would be, um, she, they, uh, John asked, what do you mean by break up the game? No, I don't mean break up the game. I meant break up, like instead of just always using worksheets or a workbook, just to break up that, you know, and do something different that's active. Um, Kaboom is just an easy way and it's very versatile, whether you're with one person, or three, whether it's science or math, there's always something like that maybe a skill or something you want to reinforce. So this is just uh, another way of doing that. Thank you, Lynn. So I don't always see the chat thing come down. Okay, this is another um, strategy. Um, it's for technique that's called cubing. So cubing, you like I'm, down here, there's the template for cubing which you're gonna have access to on the slideshow. You can click and get the template. But there's a lot, again, there's a lot of ways to use cubing. And we find that it's nice to have some basic cubes around that are just like questions like who, what, when, where, and after they read something, they roll it and they answer. Um, you can also have two cubes that have two different concepts. So you roll one, 
that says country and then another one that says another concept you're working on. For instance, you can do like the questions like who, what, when, where on your cube, or you might do something that sort of, we, it says depth of knowledge. So you might have a side of the cube that says describe it, another side that says compare it. So if you're working on, say you're working on branches of government, you can have one that says describe and if they roll describe, they have to describe it. But if they roll compare it, they're gonna compare two different. So it can go as high or low level as you like. Um, Beth says, subject pronouns on one and verbs on the other. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> Any, hey, Beth, it's your enthusiasm that makes it fun. <laughs> she says, maybe that's not so much fun, but I think it is fun. And for some, like to roll the cube is, a, is an active strategy. Um, so you can do vocabulary. Again, vocabulary, you can say things, the same sort of um, describe it, compare it associate this word to another word or analyze this word. What form of speech is it? What, how many syllables does it have? Is it, do you, what's the connotation? You know, you can go as high or low level as you wanted to. So you could do it with vocabulary. You could have two dice, one with vocabulary words on it. The other one with the describe it, compare it. I'm gonna show you on the next slide what I mean by that. Analyze it. You can have argue for it if you have a, um, something that you want to do that way. You can just have math facts like for, for, for on the next, like I have one in front of me that's just percentages. So we pick a price, they roll it and they have to find the percentage, whatever percentage they get. So like I rolled it and I got 25%. So I would have to calculate 25%. Um, you can also, the good thing about the cubing is you can have different level cubes. So one cube could have very basic skills on it and another cube could have more complex skills on it. And if you had more than one student, they don't know which one's harder or easier necessarily, but you do. So you could um, vary it that way. So here, I'll click the link. So this is the template and it just has some ideas of what you could do on the cube. And it's just, you know, cut it out. I usually print it on cardstock, but you know. So you can cut out the cube and you can practice. So there's lots of ideas down the side of things you could do with the cube. Does anybody have any idea of what they would do with the cube? Oh, sorry, everybody. X'd out of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Meg, I was just thinking that for phonics, you could have like the initial letter on one cube and then the word endings on the other. And then they could- Oh, wow, yeah. On them out. Yeah, that would be, yeah, see, we all teach different things. So people will have different ideas. Um, I know one time someone said to me, I just had trouble thinking what to put on the cube. But it's really like you could take a skill you're doing, you would do with a worksheet, right? And you would put it on the cube. It just makes it a more active sort of gamified activity. We had a, we had a comment in the chat box, but it went away. Here it is. We have smart boards online have an interactive cube. Ah, oh, that's cool. So if someone wants to do it online, their um, smart sheet, Beth says smart boards online have an interactive cube you can do with it. Interesting. So here's one, this is two examples. So on, on the right is my percentage cube, just, um, and on the left is an acute, a cube where they're showing the different um, depths of knowledge. So obvious, some of those are easier than others, right? Um, so, but you could you can print those. And then that cube is very versatile, just like the who, what, when, where, why. If you just have it on hand, you can use it over and over again. Other cubes are more specific, like the percentages. You, you know, you're just gonna do percentages with those. Um, so there's just a lot of things you can do with cubing. I like that they have that online one as well. Can you tell me, so the online one, do you get to write what you want on the cube? Yes, you do. Now you have to have a Smartboard app, but you can then write, you, you can write them and then when the kids click on them, it goes round and round and they click on each one and it gives you know the, the start. Like I used it for subject and verb when I was teaching. But you could do it for anything, and it it the kids love it. I know. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> any age, like 50 year olds. So it's just a fun alternative and you can do it via Zoom. Thank you. And, and at that website with a template, the, it links, it, it does link to an article that explains even more about cubing and different ways. Just You just have to be a little creative and think about what would I be doing? You know, how, what do I want to practice? What skill do I want to practice? And then put it into the cubing kind of thing. And I like that you said, you know, it is funny. Like we think some of these things, maybe like kaboom or the cubing, do adults want to do it? And they love to do it. Um, they, it's just a break, you know, giving you some variety, some student activity. Uh, it works really well for that kind of thing. And like I said, you can have one cube or you could have, multiple, you know, a couple cubes that they roll. One says noun, one says verb, one says noun, you know, different things like that. So does anybody have anything they've ever used a cube for? You said you use verb and noun. I've done more ESL teaching. I can imagine using, writing different vocabulary words on the cube and having students roll it and then use the vocabulary in a sentence. Very nice, yeah. So it's fairly simple because you're just gonna print the template and you can write on it on anything you want, cut it out and kind of tape it together and away you go. I mean, I guess if you had blocks in your house, you could write on the blocks, but. Um, it's a fairly simple thing to do that, that that expands your lesson and gives you practice time that isn't on a piece of paper. Something in chat. If I want to view the template, can I? It might work. Yes, the template is, if I go back a page, a slide, not a page, the template is right here and you're going to, you, it will be in the slideshow and it will, it is linkable. So you should be able to bring that right up. So. When I was, when I've tutored, I'm always thinking it's just nice to vary it up that you're not just reading and writing on like paper all the time. So little things like little tools like this really make, they help create a lot of conversation. You get to know your student and how they think and sort of you can watch how they work through their problems if it's math or whatever. Oops. Okay, this is a, 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 an activity called Chalk Talk. So the difference, be, this is sort of like um, a word cloud, not a word cloud, you know, a word web. Um, Okay, you put that, okay, zoom in here. So you put one word or you could put a phrase, a question or whatever in the middle of the board, but this is a silent activity. So it's a little different than maybe a lot of other activities. So you put the word down and you make a bubble around it. So for in my case here, we did refugee because we were reading about Ukraine. And then the idea is that no one talks and they just look and so it's almost, it's sort of reflective. They're looking and they're seeing what do they think of? What do they associate it to? And then as they get better at it, at first, it feels to me like at first, everybody just writes their own bubble. They don't connect their ideas. But as they use it more, they start to connect their ideas. So you just dry erase board, piece of paper, whatever you wanna do, put a question or a word down in a bubble. And, in my, in my classroom, I just have, they just come up whenever they think of something to add to it, they just come up. So then it starts to look like this. Come on. Give you a minute to look at that. And they can add pictures. Somebody put the flag in there, the Ukraine flag, because that's what we were doing. And I think because no one is, because it's a silent activity, it gives them time to think of associations. Do you know, you know and sometimes spelling errors. And this is a, you'll see a lot of vocabulary come out with this. Um, sometimes they take, you, you, you 
often find out, I use, I often use this as my beginning exercise to activate prior knowledge, just to see what they already know. Like on this particular one, I was very surprised when someone put Syria, I didn't know that they knew they were like refugees from Syria, but see, so that was something I learned from doing this with them. Um, What's, what was another surprise? Oh, why is the US taking so long? Okay, they, they wrote, but then to connect things to each other, they're scared. So, oh, they left everything. Oh, that's why they're scared. Or they can connect it. They're connecting the thoughts and they're building up their knowledge to, to see. So think they, what, would, what was something that you could put to start a chalk talk? What kind of thoughts would you put in there? I guess if you were doing like a unit in social studies, say mm -hmm. you were doing World War II, just put World War II in just to see what they know before they start. Yeah, and it, you can even bring it back at the end and add to it later. And then you mm -hmm. look, you know how much they learn, right? Like, so you do it at the beginning of your tutoring, you know, when you're starting and then you read your article, everything, and then bring it back and say, now what do we want to add? And let's see what they took away from that. Did they get the key? ideas that you wanted them to capture, right? Um, I use it a lot for like tier words, you know, tier two words. So, so in the past, I've done things like I put mass in the middle and, you know, some people write a Catholic ceremony and other people write a measure of, of an item, of an object in science. So it works for that too. Um, you can pose a question in the middle of there. But it's very interesting when you, when you do it with several people, you'll hear them look at it and they'll go, oh, oh, and they'll go up and add something as they start connecting things. So it gives them time to think and connect things. Could you use this um, if you had like a character in a book? Sure, to bring out the character traits and everything. That's a great yeah. idea. Yeah. Or, or even like, um, all right, everyone read the chapter last night. I put chapter two on the board. Go. Mm -hmm. okay. be, yeah. It, it lends itself. You can put one number in the middle. One, you know, number 24. Okay, that's an easy one. But 24, and then they just start when, you know, linking it, you know, some people might put, 12 plus 12, other people might put two dozen, you know, two dozen eggs or something like that, whatever they related to. So you can explore a number that way or a math concept that way. You could put a shape in there and see what they come up with. All right, so that, that one's chalk talk. This is some, this is a, a technique I use all the time with my students and they get better and better at it. And I get, and I'm seeing, I see them like connecting more. And, and so I can actually see skills advance because they're starting to, you know, connect all of the information. And like I said, bringing it back at the end, seeing what they add, it's very non-structured. So it appeals to like people who like to draw. I have students who like to draw, so they'll draw pictures in it. Um, you'll notice some people, we had a question on there. Some people had words, pictures, phrases. So it's, it's sort of um, like a very versatile strategy for a group or one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, going back. So sometimes when you're teaching, you, you, you're, maybe you're working on summarizing. So this is something I would use um, when I'm summarizing. And you can see, this is one of my students' work. So the story is there and we've put brackets to chunk the story. And then she is writing a new title for each section. So I just give them post-its and they write a new title for each section. And obviously some people are better at this than others. And sometimes they write a new title for the whole thing too. 
is this a strategy you think you would use? Like, so instead of having a worksheet where they fill in the summary, they're just using their post-its and they're thinking of new titles for each section, which is sort of summarizing or key ideas, main idea. The other thing this would this works for is sometimes after they do their post-its, they can create an outline from it. So if you're working on how to take notes or how to do an outline, they can use the post-its to then, you know, create an outline. So. I've also seen people do a similar thing where the student would actually write a question they have about the reading. Like, oh, why like did they that. say that? Yeah, I like that. There's different ways to annotate. I mean, you know, what surprises you, write what surprises you on the post-it. You know, you could have a post-it that they write words that confuse them, right, along the side, like right on the side, write any words that you find confusing or you don't know. Any other ideas for post-it use with this? I like the questions. I think um, for people who don't necessarily like to speak up, it's nice to be able to quietly write them. So that's the that's an, another strategy. I think a lot of our students really struggle. I don't know what you guys find. I find like that a lot of our students struggle with summarizing and main idea, um, no matter what level they are, that seems to be a sticking point for a lot of people. Does anyone else have that experience? May, couldn't you also use this where you ask a question and then they have to find specific details? and they could write the detail that supports the answer on the post-it. Yes, that would, yeah, that would be another way to use it, yeah. I find, I think post-its are so, so useful for so many of these kinds of things when, like this handout, there's not a lot of room to write on there, is there? So the post-its give them that extra room for like annotating or summarizing or writing questions. But it's also the idea of chunking, like breaking the passage up so that they're looking at one section at a time, which is a useful strategy for our students, you know, to chunk. Lynn, do you, do you feel that students struggle with main idea and summarizing? I think more, Yes, a lot of students struggle with main idea, but more finding the details that support it mm. because they need to be able to do that to be successful on a GED test or college entrance exam. So mm -hmm. finding the specific detail without rewriting the entire sentence or two. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, we just like, it feels like when, when we've gone through and looked at our data, like of what students were missing on their ready tests, we were so surprised at how many um, GED students miss the things on summarizing and main idea. Like we work on main idea from when we're there with our kids when they're young, right? So I think we were surprised at how many people struggle with that. So this is just another way to think like to just to do it and change it up a little bit instead of having a question at the end of the, the article, what was the main idea, A, B, C, D, this is sort of a way to, or how would you summarize it? This was a way to break it up and sort of, you know, add a little variety and things to the exercise. I, I can't figure out how to do chat. Can you hear me right now or? Yes, yes. Okay, <laughs> um, so, sorry. I was thinking about how the character changes throughout mm. the story. Um, we're reading Anne Frank right now and at the very beginning, she's kind of snarky and makes fun of people and we were laughing. And so that would be a, a good thing to note as um, the story goes on. So 
How are they doing with Anne Frank? Good. We struggle with the um, Dutch words, and she's kind of surprised when um, Anne mentions somebody going all the way. She's like, oh. they talked like that back then? I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize you did that. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I, I don't know about all of you. I'm always looking for what books will work with our students, like what, what, you know, that are a good level for them, but also are interesting for them. So I, want, I wondered how they, if they enjoyed it or not. Yeah, she's, she's had interest in it. So um, I call it book club. We read it for about 10, 15 minutes every day. And then I, I don't test her on it. It's just for the joy of reading, but. Um, nice. Yeah. 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 And I think we never like as as my class, we always have a book going that we read um, because it's the application of your reading skills, you know, like to not, you know, but um, I, like I said, I, I wondered if they would relate to that. So that's interesting. Yeah. It's, well, I don't want to take up your time, but it's funny. No. Some of the comments I'm hearing. Well, you know. go ahead. Christine says Anne Frank is an excellent book. My student read it. So their student read it too. So that's, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Well, and it, it connects so well to, you know, so many different, um, so, di you know, history and language. There's just so, it connects really well to a lot of skills. Yeah. It's, it's, so are you going yeah, to tell, very... are you gonna tell us one funny, one funny thing they said? <laughs> no, she was just, she, I was just kind of, we were laughing reading Anne Frank and you don't think about laughing while you're reading Anne Frank, but it's just so funny at the beginning when she just rips every single girl that she invited to her party. This one's pretty, but she's really stupid. This one's nice, but she's so poor and it was a mean kind of poor. And you know, just, I never thought I'd laugh when I read Anne Frank. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, so just think about just, you know, like when we're saying, like when I was saying not a worksheet, it can be a novel. It can be, you know, adding post-its to something, the kaboom sticks. There's just a lot of things you can do to get your students more involved and looking at things a little differently and make it more fun. Fun's always good, right? Okay, so this is a website and it'll be, it's a link in the PowerPoint again, that's all graphic organizers. So we don't really consider graphic organizers a worksheet per, per se, and they're super versatile. So if I click the link, you're going to see it's just a website with a lot of graphic organizers. Kind of all in one place. Someone's, okay, Rachel, that's okay. So. Uh, Rachel's putting these links in the chat as well, everyone. So if you can, if you know how to access the chat, there they are. So you can see that there's a lot of different um, graphic organizers on here. And the thing about gra graphic organizers is, again, you print it and, and you can use it on all kinds of different things you're doing. So it's not limited to like one book or one reading passage. So you have everything here from, you know, the five W's, who, what, when, where, why, to... KWL charts, I'll click on something about problem and solution. Very simple graphic organizer. You can see print and go, they're all free. So I think that's um, you know, a useful website because it has so many possibilities. Let's see if I can find those. So that's that one. Does anyone see one they don't know? We can click on that one. Information, I'll do ISP. Add the details. Well, information, but they didn't, they told us back there that wasn't really. So there's just, you know, everything from your KWL, and they have two KWL, well, KWL and KWS chart. They have story maps and planning, just a um, word webs, which is kind of like a describing wheel. Let's try a describing wheel. Let's see if that one looks like. So you put your sim similar, so you put your topic in the middle and add describing words around the spokes. That would be a really good ac accessing prior knowledge or afterwards to check what they know. There's a sandwich chart. There we go. So you have your topic, your detail, 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 and your concluding sentence for writing.
we're using the inverted triangle in my class because we're working on um, this is is good for uh, journalism. So journalism, the first paragraph is the heaviest material and then it works down. So this is a printable, you know, graphic organizer. So graphic organizers are great are great ways for students to like process them, their ideas, organize them. Does anybody use any particular graphic organizer a lot? Could, could you click on the T chart? I think it's like right at the bottom of your screen. But the what? Which one? It's a T chart. Oh, you just up. up, <laughs> go up, up. I'm going yeah, up. So up. like a stop. Right under the sandwich. Right under the sandwich. Okay, now. Oh, T chart. Yeah. Add details. See, they don't give a lot okay, of. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah. just because one thing I've noticed is that sometimes with Venn diagrams, there's not a lot of space for students to write. And so I've often just done like a, a three column chart where it's like topic one, topic two, and then in the middle is like ways that they're the same. Yeah, um, there's, there's, you know, timelines. And I mean, you could put these up like this one's going, but you could put these, you could use this for Anne Frank. <laughs> you could put this up on Zoom and then use your annotation tool to add in the timeline, right? So that could be, you know, but any, these are just, they're, everything's free. And sometimes if you're not sure how to use them, you can always, um, if you Google it, they'll tell you how to use them. So if you do Google T-chart, you can find things that explain how to use them. I was hoping they had a little more, but more instruction. But there's just, this is, it's a pretty good resource with a lot of different um, place, you know, graphic organizers in one place. I know we use KWL charts a lot. Um, and this semester we've been doing the five W's a lot because I teach a lower, you know, level reading class that we've been doing, you know, the five W's a lot. So I don't know, step-by-step -step chart. Let's look at that one, see what that looks like. Step one, so if you're teaching sequence <coughs> or chronological order, there's that. Oh, so, okay. So this is just a resource and we don't like it in a way you could say it's a worksheet because it's, it's a, but we don't really consider um, graphic organizers worksheets. They're not like drill, drilling the student over and over. They're pretty open-ended and helpful for help for our students. Now I have to get back to my uh, PowerPoint, which is always a, let's see if this, no, <laughs> yay. Okay. Okay, so that's, that, that's, the link is in the PowerPoint. Rachel's also put it into the chat, but there's a lot of graphic organizers. Their Venn diagram, their Venn diagram does look like it has some room in it for comparing and contrasting with your student. So that's another resource for, you know, just something different to do with your students. Okay, now this is just, I use store-bought games a lot in my classes and my students really, really enjoy them. So we were doing um, adjectives and so we played apples to apples. But if you consider the games you already own and then think about what do you need to do? What kind of knowledge and skills do you need to play that game? What do you have to be able to do? Then you can match that to some of the things you're working in the classroom and bring the game into the class and just play a game and lighten up. So, so apples to apples is one that I play. Does anybody else play any games that you share? Hi, it's Beth again. Hi, so, Beth. hi. so when I teach color, when I taught colors, I would use Candyland. Oh. When I would teach rooms in a house, we would play Clue. When I would teach adjectives, we would play guess who. So, and the kids would, and I don't, I retired, but the kids would rotate from game to game. We would make a couple days out of it and they would play, you know, one game for 20 minutes and switch. And then the next day they'd go to the other game. Like we would just have, we would have Scrabble mm -hmm. um, and cards when we were doing numbers, we would play cards. 
I mean, to, to a ton of stuff. I mean, I, it was, it was rare worksheets were homework, but we never did them in a, in a class. We always did activities. And there's so many great games out there. And a lot of us have them sitting in our cupboards at home. Um, we can give them a new life. We can bring them to the classroom and give them a new life. Um, we do one that Pictionary is great. If you, they have to describe, yeah. you know, um, whether it's an ESL classroom or an ABE classroom, they just have a lot of use. Anybody have any other games they play? Uh, I, I use categories for proper nouns and common nouns. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. And then there's that game 24. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, I haven't seen it in a long time, but that was fun. Would you mind describing what that game is? Yeah, uh, you get... To, I forget how many cards it's, it's been a while and um, that you have to put them together. They're numbered cards to either add, subtract, multiply, or divide to the number 24. And you can do a combination of adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing. But I, I don't remember how many cards you got. So. I, think, I think we have that here somewhere. Now I have to go look for it. <laughs> I think we have it. I think I brought mine into our office and I don't know where it is right now. I, good reminder. We're playing, we're playing battleship today because we're doing coordinate plane, which is, you know, we're going to be playing battleship. So any other games? We play, we play Quiddler a lot. Quiddler what? starts with it, it's it's letter cards, letter and vowel cards, consonant and vowels, and it starts with you start with three. You have to make a three letter word and then a four letter word. It goes up to a ten letter word, oh and then depending on well, it, I very rarely have gotten that far, but um, depending on the level, the student where you stop it, and sometimes I allow them to use a dictionary because the point is making the word, not knowing it. I mean from memory. That's cool. I, I wrote that one down, Quiddler. I think I've seen it in the store, but I didn't know what it was. I actually tried to teach. Okay. So if you Google online um, Wordle for the for a class, you just Google Wordle for your class for a class, you can put in your own word and play Wordle with them. Um, I tried it with my students because they knew everybody was playing Wordle and they didn't know what it was and they just needed, they wanted to play it, but they needed more support with it. And it's a lot, it's, it, it's a thinking game, you know, like you have to draw conclusions and narrow your choices and things like that. And they really enjoyed that. And I think it had a lot of um, educational, you know, it, I think it was worth their time you know, to play with it and think of words and think of, they start thinking about what vowel combinations work and how you have to have at least one vowel in there and things like that. So it was, it, it was an interesting, you know, exercise or lesson to do. Uh, word art, before Wordle was its current form, it was a form of art. And we have a link in the chat from Beth that says wordart.com. And they could change the shapes and the kids would just all list words and it would take out duplicates often. So yeah. it would just have the individual words and you could make it hearts or ovals or butterflies or all kinds of shapes. And then we would print them. The kids would put them around the room. So it's paper, but the, the kids loved it because it was very, you could create the shape you wanted. I don't know if you can still make all those shapes, but we used to play it all the time. Yeah, I think like sometimes you just need to um, when we're tutoring or working with someone, sometimes I think I, we need to slow down and just explore a concept more and games give us that time to like play with things, you know, explore them more because like even looking at that word on the screen, awesome, awesome, amazing, remarkable, majestic, and that can help them with their writing, um, enriching their writing and things so I mean, I love a good game. I'll admit it. Um, and there are a lot of online ones. I think you've talked about like quizzes and Kahoot and different games like that that are online. But sometimes just these games that are sitting in your cup, in your closet or shelf somewhere um, have a lot of value for our students. I used to use 
Um, I was going to I used to use concentration a lot, but I would just make, I would just use index cards or like cut up pieces of paper and make my own deck. So it'd be like, you know, like I did one where it was different, like the percent and the fraction, you know, matching well, the percent or the, or the decimal and the equivalent fractions so that have to match those. Um, that's fun. Someone else was going to say something too. I love that. Going to say, don't even I mean, use a deck of cards. Yeah. I mean, you can use a deck of cards to do decimals, fractions, whatever, however you want to do it. Mm -hmm. And the students like it because they're making their own problems up mm -hmm. as opposed to being, every problem is different as opposed to doing a worksheet where they're all doing exactly the same. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, when we played apples to apples, they were laughing so hard. In fact, there was one student there who was so quiet. I've never seen him enjoy something so much. Like, he, you know, because he's so quiet normally and playing a game just kind of broke the ice for him. You know, it, it just made it, I don't know if it's less fearful, more comfortable, I don't know. But um, he just, you get to see another side of people and get them to play with words and play with numbers. And that's fun. And, and I think we can get stuck on like what the textbook has or what the worksheet says and we forget how it applies to their life. And this games are practical like application to life. We all kind of, hopefully most of us play some games. Right. Okay, so does anybody have any questions or any ideas they want to share? Somebody has something in the chat. Oops, nope, sorry. I'm sorry, no, I put in about Kia.com. Uh-huh. Yeah, so I'd buy a version, but obviously not everyone should buy a version. But if you don't buy it, everything is there you'd want for every subject you could imagine. But I buy it because I create the games. Mm -hmm. But um, everything, and, and it's a big hit because you can find all kinds of different activities. Yes, they I, you say in your, in your post, you said about who wants to be a millionaire. We have fun with that in our class. We use the Kia for that. Nice, yeah. I've never purchased it. So you feel like you get your money's worth from purchasing it? I do. I think it's $100 a year, so it's not cheap. Key, uh, Quizlet's a lot less expensive, but I do because I've created like seven, maybe 700 games over the last 10 years. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I use it all the, all the time and I could adapt them to what I'm doing now. So, yeah, but you can find everything you want for free. You just put in the, you click on the subject matter and you can find lots of activities. It's, it's great. It's nice diversion. I find that the online games like Quizlet, Kahoot, Kia, you can find everything. Just make like, sometimes I you preview it before you use it. You know what I mean? Like if you're using one that someone else made, you want to don't just look at the first couple of questions, look through the whole thing because if somebody's making them, that sure. might not be exactly what you, there might be errors in it. You just have to look through. True. I hate that's happened. I have found errors, but I, I didn't buy a, a version after I stopped teaching. So I don't use it anymore, but I used to find some mistakes on things that I, even I would make mistakes. No, I would make mistakes. That's okay. <laughs> well, so does anybody have any other great ideas or things they use with your to with your students that really are away from worksheets that help you, you know, practice things or figure out what they know and things like that? Any other ideas? I use, um, with my ESL student, um, he likes the crossword puzzle on the News For You website. Mm -hmm. um, he gets to practice vocabulary, learn some new vocabulary words, and also um, think about things like plurals and past tenses, because sometimes, you know, one of them will fit in the space in the crossword puzzle and the other won't that kind of thing. So, so that's good for vocabulary for my student. You use the online version? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And Christine said they sometimes do word searches and that, and that helps him practice finding words. They, and, you know, they also, when they're using those word searches, I think they have to like, they're searching for it, but they are also looking for letters that work together. So I think that's, you know, like when you have to find the word blue, you know, you have to find the UE together and that's a good, that's, that's good. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming and have fun this summer. Well, it's coming into summer, right? With your students. Um, I hope you took some the mind away or have things to share, but thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you just go to the next slide? Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to remind everyone, I'm going to put the survey in the in the chat if you want to give us some feedback about this. We're starting to collect ideas for next year's um, webinar series. So if you have something you would like to hear about, please do that. And then just a reminder that next month, we're going to hear from Rose Joy Fine um, about a uh, trauma-informed uh, approach to supporting family and learners' success. And that will be on Tuesday, June 14. Um, also, if you want a recording of any of the sessions, maybe you missed one, or maybe you want to review all the resources that Meg shared, um, they're, on, they're in the PD portal, but they are also, um, on the PA Adult Ed Resources website that I just put in the chat. So thank you very much and see you next month. come and go slowly <laughs> yeah some of us just sit around while we're doing something else sorry, <laughs> sorry. Rachel, Rachel I just sent you an email reintroducing you to Christina in Davina she oh, was okay and she'd like to chat with you about various things oh so, cool just, just yeah. so you know I'd be happy to talk to her yeah thanks for doing figured that. you would all right okay thanks so much I'll see you guys later all right um, if I wasn't retiring, I'd wonder what trauma-informed approach was like. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll be really, um, it'll be really interesting. Um, You're still recording, Rachel. Oh.